Hey guys, it's Stephen here. Welcome back to another episode of Five Things That We Learned. After five goals against Southampton, that was an easy link, wasn't it? We beat Southampton 5-2 last night. We're back to anyways after that crushing Derby Day defeat. So today, I'm going to talk about five things that I learned from that game. Before I do that, though, you know the drill by now. If you haven't already downloaded One Football, I, I don't understand. Why wouldn't you do that? Go and download it right now in the link in the description. It's an absolutely fantastic app with all the Manchester City news and all the world, the news from the world of football that you personally need to know about go and download it right now in the link in the description below it's free costs absolutely zero pence it gets all the stats all the transfer news and all the gossip that you want sent straight to your phone and a nice little bonus that helps support my channel as well so you want to help support a big blue here go and download one football right now in the link in the description go and do it go and do it right let's get into five things that we learned from this game i'm going to start initially with rotation blues now what i mean by that is that of course we're rotating an awful lot of players at the moment but is it a negative thing? Is it a thing that's potentially holding Manchester City back? Now, I'm not saying it is, because we're winning an awful lot of games, but one thing I personally notice is that we're rotating an awful lot of players at the moment because Guardiola is trying to keep the squad fresh, definitely, but there's also an element of Guardiola trying to keep the, the squad um, happy, I guess, to be honest. When you've got that many senior players and they're all fresh and fit and raring to go, well, you've got to play them every now and then, otherwise you get descent and you get unhappiness and you get egos and you get all that kind of stuff. It doesn't make it easy, of course, but it's just a part of having a squad that we've got. It's a nice problem to have the whole my diamond shoes fit too tight kind of conundrum. I just quoted Sam Lee there the other day. But either way, um, you know what I'm getting at. And one problem with this potentially is it creates a lack of rhythm. It creates a lack of consistency amongst the players. And I think we're starting to see some signs of that. Now, obviously, things aren't really a worry yet, but I'm getting the results up now just to look at in front of me. Um, and we are starting to concede goals. That's what's starting to concede, uh, concern me. Yesterday against Southampton, our defence was a little bit porous. So and now you can turn around and go, yeah, but the penalty was soft. True. Uh, and their goal involved, second goal involved an awful lot of luck with the ball ricocheting around in loads of places. True. But let's not pretend that Southampton didn't also have a, a shitload of chances. You know, they had plenty of chances to score goals in that game. Um, and we were definitely more susceptible at the back. And that follows obviously conceding two goals against United from pretty sloppy defending as well. We did concede against Wolves and West Ham as well. Obviously a clean sheet against Mudge and Gladbach, but we conceded basically in a lot of our recent games and now we've got to the point where um, we are conceding goals at a slightly higher rate than previously. It could be that we're just reverting to the mean, but when you had such a stingy defence previously, it does kind of make you want that again. And if there's room for improvement, you've got to seek it basically. So it's frustrating to see that Manchester City, as good as they are, well, it does feel like our defensive steeliness has, well, it's dissolved a little bit. We definitely aren't quite the same beast. And that's because, in my opinion, we're just trying we're trying to keep everyone happy. We're taking plays an awful lot, which is definitely something we have to do to keep everyone happy, admittedly. Um, but as a result, you are going to see, we can see the four in our last two, or five, sorry, five in our last three, or six in our last four, if you want to say that way. Either way, it's a lot of goals compared to what it was previously. And Edison can't get the clean sheet record anymore. Shouldn't really matter. But basically, we are entering the business end of the season now. We've got, uh, we've got finals, we've got champions, League knockouts, we've got um, quarterfinals in the FA Cup, we've got uh, a, a potential route to the Premier League title. We need to make sure that it's not um, a pattern developing because I personally feel like we've noticed some inconsistency in the side at the moment. I could be overthinking, but it's something I've noticed. Secondly, Phil Foden fuel. Man, that kid is good, isn't he? It was good to see Phil Foden back in the starting lineup last night, and long may it continue. Ryan Sterling, I love him, but I don't think it's any coincidence that last night we looked an awful lot more fluid with a player banging form with energy and ideas. Um, Sterling's a very good player, and I will defend him until the cows go home. He's a genuinely very good player, but he isn't in his best form at the moment, and I do believe you should play players who are producing and delivering the goods. It's a very simple way of viewing football, admittedly, but I don't think it's a incorrect one really. Phil Foden currently is on fire and last night he was at his dynamic best. I mean what I love about Phil Foden is the versatility to his game. He should have had a penalty. I'll get onto that later because I'm still absolutely fuming. Should have had a penalty. He had a couple of very good chances but he was involved in two goals as well. Creating two goals. Um, absolutely brilliant. Genuinely brilliant from Foden yesterday all over the place. Uh, giving Southampton's defence um, a tireless tireless task to follow him around the pitch. Phil Foden is a fantastic footballer and currently maybe there's an argument to 
suggests that he's part of our best front three. And I think a lot of people will probably agree with that. I mean, it's not good news for Sterling because he leads me on to the next man, Riyad Mahrez. Riyad, I said that. Riyad Mahrez. Um, Royal Riyad, man. Like, I mean, we know he's very, very, very good anyway, but he's showing form at the moment, which I think is probably his best form in a Manchester City shirt. I do believe currently he's in his hottest streak as a Manchester City player. Um, and it's lovely because sometimes when you've had the indignity of that refereeing decision from John Moss and not giving a penalty, it's very easy to go in a slump and maybe start to drop your shoulders. And this City side do have a history of probably feeling a little bit sorry for themselves every now and then. Um... I mean, we're not used to adversity. We're often in front. So we don't tend to hand it very well. So it's very important that when you've got a moment like that, which could be very negative, that you have a player who's capable of turning the game around just like that. Uh, and Riyad can do that. Riyad's one of the players. And that moment of magic to bell it in from that far out. And then his footwork as well to create that third goal. Uh, lovely, lovely footwork. Um, he's just the kind of ability that can turn a game on its head. And then, of course, his quality for his second goal as well. Mares at the moment is absolutely unstoppable. Um, and when you've got that level of quality it really can change the course of a season and long may continue and once again going back to the previous point with Phil Foden is Phil Foden and Mahrez our most informed forwards at the moment and wingers they almost certainly are and there is definitely an argument to say they should be playing every single game I mean what I want to mention as well um Bernardo's link up with Mahrez is really good. Those two seem to have a very good understanding of how they move around the pitch and how they link up. And currently, uh, Mahrez, make sure Bernardo's on the pitch, make sure Mahrez is on the pitch, make sure Foden's on the pitch. It seems to be a very logical conclusion given Manchester City's current form. Uh, the fourth point I want to talk about was that it was just a blip. <laughs> Manchester United, um, they came to the Etihad, they beat us, fair play, here's your tiny little, we beat Manchester City trophy, but ultimately, it was just a blip, uh, another win, that is our 22nd win in 23 games now, uh, if you want to look at it that way, um, it was just another game that we can move on from, it was absolutely essential that this side picked themselves up, dusted themselves down, and got back to winning ways after the disappointment of the derby, we really had to make a little bit of a statement, I don't think we were at our fluid best, I don't think Manchester City were unstoppable or insane or anything like that but we were good we were good enough basically and despite a nervy first 10 minutes where Southampton were very much in the game we did find our composure moments of magic and eventually we saw the game out with a very comprehensive 5-2 victory could have been a maybe maybe 5-3 would have been a fair result or something like that but then once again who knows what happens if that penalty is given but Overall, it was just a blip, and I'm really, really impressed by the mentality of the players yesterday to get back up on the horse and crack on, basically, and uh, essentially rub out any confidence that gave Manchester United. I'm sure they'll still feel top of the world and all that kind of stuff after that victory, but it's nice to know that... Um, we haven't given them another seed of hope, so we can't let any doubt grow into manifesting into something a lot more, a lot more worrying. Um, finally, uh, I had to go there. I had to go there, because even Guardiola went there. Incredible. Uh, useless VAR, useless referees. Um, I put useless VAR at the bottom, but it could be easily be useless refs. No, I'm going to change it to useless refs in the edit because um, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I reached the end of my tether last night with the absolutely farcical quality of refereeing in the Premier League. I mean, that is one of the worst decisions I've ever seen from a referee, simply because it was such an obvious decision to give. It wasn't one of those confusing decisions. It wasn't one of those ones where you can go, I can see how he's got confused there. I can see what he's done. He's just totally misread the situation. It was just the most blatant penalty you will ever see. Honestly, um, if I, I mean, it's as blatant to me as someone just punching a player in the area. It's that level of blatant. It's a textbook foul in every sense of the word. I can't understand how any professional referee can sit there and look at that and not go... That's clearly a foul. That is clearly a penalty. The only debate, having watched it back now, is whether he should have been sent off or something like that. I don't know if that's even a rule anymore with double jeopardy. But either way, um, useless, genuinely useless stuff from the referees. And we shouldn't have to accept this level of incompetence. I mean, I said last night on Twitter, what are us fans meant to think when we see a decision that diabolically bad? Are we meant to go, ha, it happens? Are we meant to genuinely just sat there, sit there, take it and agree with it and think, oh, that's just football? Are we really meant to just accept that level of incompetence? to see. I don't really think we should. I genuinely believe when you see that level of incompetency, you're meant to question it. I want You expect an apology at very least. I mean, I don't blame those fans who go, it's a fix. When you see something that bad, what you just go, well, the only conclusion is that he didn't want to give it. And why? It's just nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. Uh, Guardiola was asked afterwards, oh, should ex-players uh, help with VAR decisions? Why, though? Seriously, why? It's not hard to understand. If they're saying that referees can't get these decisions right with ex-footballers, why? 
How can they not understand football? It's that simple. If I can see it, if your nan can see it with cataracts and all that kind of stuff and impaired vision, if every single pundit can see it, if commentators can see it, though, Henchcliffe, whatever reason, the commentary decided not to. But basically, if everyone can see it, why can't referees see it? It means they are incompetent and not fit for their job. They shouldn't need ex-players to answer these questions for them. It's so obvious. Sack them. If they're that useless, sack them. And I don't want anyone to lose their jobs, but at least suspend them until they show they're not incredibly incompetent. I'm sorry, but in most jobs, if you are that bad at your job, you get a performance appraisal and get asked to book up your ideas or you get moved on. I don't want referees sacked, but I want them to not be entirely useless and entirely um, entirely uh, unaccountable. They are totally um, immune to any form of criticism, and it's, it's nonsense, man. It's absolute nonsense. Guys, thanks for watching this video and of rant there about useless referees. Let me know down in the comments what you made of the game and what you personally took from the game yesterday. Uh, lots of very interesting interesting talker boys i loved it thank you so much to everyone who watched and also go watch out the fan view video i did last night where i jumped on Streamyard and got chatting away to some of the members it was great fun let me know if you want to see more of that in the future download one football in the link in the description below and thank you to my patreon producer ahmed al ali for his wonderful support and all the patrons currently scrolling down the side of the screen you're all my ogs absolute heroes a lot of you for now though go watch all the videos from last night and i'll see you very very soon